Um, so I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm Ben Morris. I'll be moderating the discussion. Um, and I come at this from um, kind of the, the contractor side, been involved in a number of different contracts, uh, software development, um, scope of contracts. And so very interested to see you know, what we can learn about improving how that works. Um, so I'll um, ask uh, Jonathan for a brief intro. All right. Hi, Ben. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jonathan Mostowski. I was uh, I work for the U.S. Digital Service, and I'm detailed at the Defense Digital Service, where I'm an acquisition strategist and bureaucracy hacker, trying to uh, improve the way we acquire software development services and modern technology. Uh, I was a contracting officer for about 13 years, and I've uh, been in the federal government for about 15. Great. Thank you. And Paula. Hi everyone, I'm Paula Wagner. I am the division chief for the system ciliary division at USCIS. Um, I have been in the government for about 12 years or 13 years um, and like to do a lot of um, fun, innovative ways to uh, procure services and technology. Thank you, and Josh? Sure. I'm Josh Seckel. Um, I'm not currently in the government, um, although I was in the government at USCIS um, helping to experiment with fun new ways to procure uh, technology and services and uh, am now a contractor uh, trying to figure out how to respond to fun new ways uh, to procure government services. So have seen both sides of this of this funness. Excellent. And Carl? Hey, um, I'm uh, a, a partner at Open Tech Strategies, specializing in um, open source software process and development. I have never worked in the government. Um, I've been on the other side of, of being a contractor and subcontractor on various government contracts. Uh, my background is actually as a programmer, so my agile experience is, is from the development and technical management side. Um, and the perspective I'm bringing here is mostly how to integrate that with um, uh, the particular benefits of open source development for governments and how the, that works with Agile and how that works with procurement. Perfect. And uh, last but not least, Polly. Hi there, and good afternoon, everyone. Polly Hall. I'm the strategy lead for the Department of Homeland Security's Procurement Innovation Lab. So. I do have a cool job of being able to help teams across the DHS components come up with innovative, appropriate strategies to um, deliver to mission faster and uh, with more meaningful results. Obviously, IT modernization is a huge part of uh, what we buy across um, the DHS enterprise. So I um, have had a lot of growing um, experience, always growing experience um, with agile um, contracting. Look forward to today's discussion. Yeah, me too. And, uh, you know, to kind of kick this off, I think it's interesting if I look back at sort of younger me, early career me, if, if anyone would have suggested that I would be doing anything in the direction of contracts or talking about um, uh, contracting and deliverables and performance measures, I would think that that person was, was crazy and should be committed. Um, you know, I, I kind of had originally thought of that as in terms of like, terms and conditions and, you know, uh, kind of legalese sort of things. But, but the reality is in the government space, particularly with the dynamic of contractors doing a lot of the hands-on delivery work, it is one of the impediments or enablers of really getting the real work done. Um, and so where the rubber meets the road with things like how deliverables are defined, how performance metrics are defined, um, and all those little um, nitpicky details can drive all kinds of good or not so good behavior. Um, so uh, we went through and allowed uh, registrants to enter in questions um, as part of the registration process. I'll also point out for those on the line, there is a, a chat feature where you are also welcome to drop questions that you think of in there. Um, but just starting off with one of the questions, really digging into um, getting to a low level um, is uh, about 
EVM. So the question is, is EVM compatible with Agile delivery? Um, and I'll ask uh, uh, Jonathan to kick this one off. But, but first, just as a background for those that might not be familiar with that particular alphabet soup, um, that's uh, earned value management, which is something that is often associated with um, things like um, the, the PMP certification or classical project management, which is in itself is often associated with waterfall development in the IT world and not agile development. Um, so uh, Jonathan, do you want to kick off the discussion on this topic? Yeah, sure. Uh, so this is, I, I've been kind of in this space of bringing agile to the federal government from what I'd consider the beginning. So a little over eight years ago, and this has always come up and, uh, you know, nobody's going to ever completely agree. So I'll just give you my perspective for what it's worth. Uh, earned value management was designed to track cost schedule and performance across cost, primarily cost reimbursable contracts with integrated master schedules. Um, they were really created because it was becoming clear that we were entering into these long-term vehicles and not really knowing whether we're going to receive anything at the end of these very expensive contracts until we got to the end. And, and then at that point, we were so vested in the solution. It didn't matter if it was going to cost more or right or wrong. You just poured more money. So kind of good money after bad. And um, you know, the, the, the reason why Agile is becoming so popular is because of the build small, fail small model. I mean, you know very early on, right from the very beginning, if what you're getting is worthwhile. And EVM generates a lot of cost and uh, paper, which are two things I don't like. And, um, you know, I kind of say, I don't need a, a report to tell me I liked my sandwich because I just ate my sandwich and I know what I liked it or I didn't, right? And, and that's kind of like uh, EVM versus Agile, right? So like, you know what you're getting every iteration and you know the trends of it. I mean, there's absolutely things you have to measure with burn downs and burn up charts and such um, and quality, but, but getting paper instead of getting developers to build things is, is not the right model. And then just real quickly, because there's a lot of people here probably have opinions on it. Um, my particular view on how agile development services should be acquired is that they're commercial services. We got this model from the commercial marketplace. Commercial services fall under FAR part 12. Uh, generally, they, because of their iterative nature, they should be smaller in size. Simplified acquisition procedures under 13.5 go up to $7 million, so you can buy them very efficiently. Uh, commercial contracting only really allows fixed price and TNM contracts, neither of which makes sense with earned value management. Um, so really, um, while the, you can do earned value management on fixed price if the program manager perceives significant cost schedule and performance risk, uh, you shouldn't necessarily do it. So I don't think EVM is appropriate for Agile. I know there's EVM Agile models, but that is just attempts to make a square peg fit into a round hole. Over. Well, and interjecting real quick, I see a comment um, from Dan Taylor um, and about the, there's the 509 panel, um, the report coming out kind of generally recommending against um, EVM. And for for those that aren't familiar, um, I think it was, uh, I, I forget the scope of that panel, if it's kind of DOD focused or, or government wide, that's DOD. Okay, I'm getting the nods for DOD. Um, but it is kind of um, re-examining a, a host of contracting practices and that's probably about as far as I can go in explaining it without. So, so not to keep- Even more foolish. Yeah, not to keep talking, but um, so I, I participated in the 809 panel and helped them. Um, so some of their EVM thoughts may reflect mine, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's the 809 panel. It was uh, directed out of the NDAA 2018 for a study of DOD acquisition practices. Cool. And, and I'm curious if others on the panel had um, had to deliver or, or you know, manage delivery under that context of a, an EVM mandate and trying to do agile work. So, oh. so I'll, I'll give my two cents. I luckily have not, um, but I have had to success, you know, strongly advocate um, for not applying EVM to agile projects um, based on the very same arguments that um, uh, Jonathan presented. We've had conversations about this in the past. Uh, he he um, gave me great counsel for one of the projects where I was getting a lot of resistance because 
you know, we're trying to use traditional methods and in fact, methods that really are appropriate under cost type contracting only to, to um, try to prove that Agile works. And um, there are many other more effective um, metrics, which I know is much of the content of this conversation that we can drive toward um, that will show that, you know, I, I try to, and, and there's two sides. Right? One is the actual customer users and their their satisfaction and delivery of working product to them is going to be much more meaningful than some cost schedule um, uh, report that I'm going to look at after the fact and then have to retroactively adjust. And so when we talk about value, it's just reconceptualizing that and understanding the, um, the, the, the incremental value and the constant collaboration and communication and delivery um, negates the need for retroactive reporting about things that already happened that are too late to fix. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So can I add my cent and a half to this as well? I totally agree with everything that was just said. And um, I have been on contracts where EVM was already a thing set up and they want to do the conversion to Agile. And so having that, and so you can make it work and there are actually studies that say this is how to do it and, and basic, yeah, you can even use the slope of, of, your, of your burn down or burn up charts. Um, to basically uh, equivalent to EVM, um, but but having that discussion, if you're not in a clean situ, if you're and if you're not in what I call a clean agile, i.e., from the start we're going to do agile and here's what we're going to do, but instead are in a transition transformation where you have a contract that wasn't agile and now you're trying to move there and figure those out. It it is that conversation and okay, we still have to meet the EVM requirements, but what are the things that we can do such that we're actually delivering value with it as opposed to, yeah, this is a big, uh, a big load of paper that we're just delivering. And, and that absolutely needs to be a collaboration between the, the contractor and the Fed as you're trying to make that transition to eventually get to a point where you can say, yeah, EVM was not a smart thing to do to begin with, but right now it's a contractual deliverable. Right. And, um, and you were hitting on um, this idea that, you know, EVM is kind of missing the mark, right? Um, and, and well, everyone was. Um, but what I did want to do is kind of pivot this um, and kind of toss it to uh, Paula next. But what, what I wanted to pivot to was kind of really looking at how can we get at that heart of business value? Because um, I've seen all manner of good, bad, and ugly metrics or, or ways to kind of measure success. Um, and, and Jonathan had that point about, you know, if I just ate the sandwich, I know it's good. Um, and I think a lot of times business value is something similar. So, so I'm kind of curious, uh, starting with Paula, but also getting other points of view, of um, what are the sort of things that we can look at other than kind of just like, you know, yes, I'm happy, thumbs up, thumbs down, Caesar type of evaluations of contractors and the kind of thing that can satisfy contracting officers in terms of making them satisfied that we have some objective performance management going on to hold contractors accountable. Yeah, I'm Ben. Um, so I know um, CIS is always looking for new ways to measure performance and looking at metrics across the board, um, especially with um, our initiative for electronic processing. So not only are we trying to look at what is velocity on individual teams, but what is velocity you know, across um, a myriad of, of different teams that are all trying to accomplish one goal. Um, so we've been trying to come up with different metrics that can be kind of standardized across the um, different program teams um, or Agile teams. So some of the ones that we started to come up with were like service delivery. So the number of um, requirements delivered, how many deployments we can do, um, and you know our mean time to um, to recover from a from an outage. Um, we're trying to look at functional 
um, metrics um, that provide value to us, but also to the business. Um, and then obviously we are always looking at, um, you know, our um, deployments and making sure that we can deliver, you know, every time we put something in production so that we have a pipeline um, that makes, that manages risk for us. Um, but we're always open to ideas. So if anybody has um, ideas, we're always looking for um, different metrics. I can, this is Carl Fogel. Uh, I can jump in if no one else was about to speak. Ben, I don't know if you, how you wanted to manage that. Uh, yes, please go for it. Um, I just wanted to, to add to what Paula was saying and also to say that one of the things I appreciate about this panel is how much I'm learning from the other panelists. Um, I, for example, about the um, 809 panel. But one of the, so coming from an open source software perspective, one of the main things that we're always uh, encouraging agencies to look for in procurement is, okay, there's, there's the technical deliverable, there's the software, does it work, does it have the features you wanted, is it deployable, but part of the value of open source is a lack of vendor lock-in. The idea is a vendor has delivered a thing to you, they may also have the M&O contract afterwards, um, but you need to know that you have that thing independently, that you could engage another vendor to make enhancements. You could even have someone else deploy it and other agencies can take up the code and deploy it. So one of the deliverables that we, we always urge to have actual measurement techniques for is third, independent third party deployability of the software, not just at the end when it's delivered, but throughout the development cycle. Um, and that dovetails nicely with continuous integration processes and agile development because you have to be able to stand up the thing at the push of a button and automate the deployments anyway. And this, this is just about actually having third parties come in and do a process we sometimes call it like open source quality assurance. Have some other firm come in and actually do that deployment um, and prove along the way it's at several stages to the, the um, procuring entity that yes, you are, you are still free from vendor lock-in. Two weeks later, yes, you're still free of vendor lock-in. Um, so it's not just about the code's technical performance, it's also about deployability and administrability by other entities. And Carl, that may, I totally agree, especially with reusability, which is mm -hmm. so important for you know, budget purposes, but then also you kind of mentioned the, um, the pipe, your kind of like DevOps pipeline, and um, I also want to mention you know, um, automated testing and test coverage. Um, is also important too. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, ideally, every vendor is doing it all the time in practice. Um, not always, and sometimes that's because they're being squeezed on budget, and the first thing to go is test coverage, right? So I don't. I'm not casting blame there, but but it has to be budgeted for. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would just say in general. I mean, we, I mean, we've kind of gone from like EVM to like what do you measure to, you know. And, and it's really th these conversations in my mind are kind of like, how do we make agile as much like what we're used to and comfortable with as possible so people will do it? And that's really not the best way to be innovative. Uh, I mean, if you look at agile, just as agile would be implemented without trying to put a government lens over it, uh, the, the metrics that are there and the deliverables that are there are there because they make sense, right? They're not there for any other purpose. It's, it's not because it's required by some statute or because someone made a mistake somewhere and so they created this you know, policy around it. It's there because it adds value as opposed to um, uses resources. So most of the things you'll see in a modern development process will include very live transparent tools that replace what we think of as far as like reporting and, and to some degree metrics, right? So like a collaborative work environment for communication, like for example, and I'm not promoting one tool over another, I'll just throw ones out there, but like for example, Slack, right? And a com collaborative environment for requirements to go in and then be determined whether or not they've been completed. So like Trello, if you're like in a Kanban type environment or like Jira is often used. Um, again, these are just examples, there's lots of variations out there. But the point being that anyone related to the project 
um, and in some cases in truly like open environments, anyone, anyone um, can go in and see at any point in time where the project is in relation to where the project thinks the project should be, right? So, um, I mean, specifically when you get to metrics, as, as I mentioned before, and as Paula just mentioned a second ago, I mean, you do have like, you know, standard deliverables uh, or metrics like um, burn down charts that are tracking, you know, the velocity against the uh, capacity and, and the anticipated um, story point ex execution. And then to, as Paul mentioned, like the test coverage and quality and bug defect rates. So, I mean, these are all things that are material and valuable, but they're not metrics from the traditional government standpoint where it's like, we want to be able to like hang the appropriate person when this program inevitably fails. It's meant to be guardrails to keep it from getting off course. And it's a very different application of metrics. It's meant to be like, okay, we, we thought we were going to be able to do this much and we're, we're trending a little down, you know, what are the causes of this? And like taking like, you know, extreme ownership of the problem and, and trying to figure out how can we cor course correct so that together we succeed. So. Nice. Sorry, I'll jump in here. You know, Jonathan makes such a good point. And I think that gets kind of to like one of the more kind of, philosophical underlying um, aspects of where we're all heading and where we have been heading um, from from the start uh, with with these initial efforts about eight years ago is is that at the end of the day we're looking for contracting officers to understand what agile is and how it how it's bought and and that goes for some program side folks too within the government but but the intention there is that it isn't looking to put everything in writing and hold, you know, contractors accountable to the, you know, most minuscule technical requirement, um, functionality requirement that, that we have that that wasn't working. That's why we're at, we're, we're changing course and iterating and, and, and putting different development practices into place. And the intention is to collaborate along the way for government to be engaged throughout the process so that these these static reports and metrics are, are less relevant in real time because you, 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 let me back up there. You need them in real time because they help inform decisions on the spot versus reports to then go use to hang somebody over their head. And so it's a different level of engagement on the ground after contracts are awarded, but all of that goes into developing the contracts. And, and um, so we need folks to understand that and to learn and, and, um, really buy into this new model for it to, to truly work. Yeah, and, I, and I, I wanted to piggyback on that to kind of pivot the conversation again slightly, but um, but also just okay. abuse the soapbox of a, of a moderator. Um, ben, can I add one oh, comment? Before oh, yeah, go ahead, Josh, sorry. Sorry, um, the other thing that I was going to add is, and I know that CIS is starting to do this, a focus on outcomes, not outputs, mm -hmm. and actually measuring the outcome Rather than, rather than test coverage, the outcome is quality. Rather than, hey, how many points did you deliver? The outcome is some business value, which we need to find a way to measure. And measuring those outcomes actually provides value and a, and a way of saying, are we getting our money's worth in a lot more real way than, than I delivered 82 points? Well, I don't know what that means from, an, from a value, business value perspective. Yeah, thank you. No, and that's I that's the way that we we kind of don't even look at the number of story points anymore. It's about the requirements that we get out. Yeah, and I think I really want to capture that and and um, and and you know what Paula was saying about not really. Um, it's one thing to have this transparent environment and this culture where um, everyone has visibility to a team's progress, and you can see kind of points estimated and actual achievement and so on. But as soon as you start to take that metric like, you know, this sort of thing that has a number assigned to it um, and start to report on it either to executives or you start to make it a contractual thing, or in some cases I've even heard of contracts with some degree of performance payment per story point. So, I mean, there, there's ways to take these things where it kind of, in a certain trail of logic kind of makes sense, but can just be absolutely destructive if used the wrong way. And I think that's where it would be great to kind of start to dive into some examples of those, you know, those edge cases or those nuances where things that seem like a good rational idea from one perspective could be really bad or, you know, kind of giving some guidance to folks out there about, you know, where to draw that line 
of um, you know what is how can we focus on more of the outcome and how can we not take a nice tool like velocity that can help teams reflect internally um, and, and how can we kind of keep all that machinery you know working the right way and, and keep people incentivized um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious for thoughts there and um, you know really open it up to whoever's um, whoever has good examples of, of some concrete things that they've used in the past that either you know worked or didn't work uh, I'll just say that this, this is not a very metrics friendly um, approach but one of the one of the sort of immeasurable but unquestionably good side effects that we've seen from uh, that it, or at least is made possible with open source development is when the vendor or the vendor plus maybe some in-house staff on the, on the um, procuring side are working in an open source manner, what you have is developers uh, who are motivated by the fact that third party peers are riding along and watching their work and responding, responding by filing bug reports or even by participating in code review making contributions, reviewing documentation, et cetera. But those third parties are under a different management hierarchy. And so suddenly the, the developers at the vendor are playing for an audience that is not just their managers and not just the sort of official heads of project who show up in the weekly meetings, but for these peers who, who they have something technically in common with. And although that's hard to measure, it can have a, a really nice effect on project velocity and on the the sort of emotional attachment to quality that the development team has so it's, it's sort of one of those those side effects of, of doing a truly open source method that is is hard to quantify but we believe based on observation that it has been quite beneficial and we've been on both sides of that fence we've been helping the procuring side and we've been the developer side seeing others come into the project yeah i, I would agree transparency uh, is an incredible way to improve quality. Uh, so, you know, engineers won't take shortcuts when they know other engineers are going to be looking at their work and, and identifying those things. You know, if you're, if you're doing it in sort of a closed environment, you can, you know, I'll get back to that or I'll clean that up on the next release. I just want to get it done. Um, so transparency is in incredibly important. Uh, another one that is also not beautifully metric related, but I have found um, to be extremely effective is, is the structure of the contract itself. So when, when you, and, and, and this is not a fully perfect world, um, you know, like, uh, so having short contracts, modular contracts, so, uh, you know, FAR part 39 that's been there for a while, acquisition of IT 39.1 talks about modular contracting. And that's really where the concepts of agile contracts came from. Um, so, you know, yay for the FAR, they did something for us, right? So um, the, that's what we leveraged to create the early phases of iterative contract setup. And, and that structure where, you know, you're not a five-year contract, because even if it's a base plus four options, there's a pretty comfortable feeling that uh, on a, a waterfall program, you're going to get the other four options because if not, they, the government gets nothing, right? They're just going to get a stack of EVM reports. We'll tie back to that. But um, under this modular development and this iterative development, being able to say like, you know, we can walk away from this program today and we've gotten something. Now, maybe we didn't get enough and that's why we want to walk away, but we got something that's deployable. Um, or if you're not getting anything that's deployable and hopefully you walked away pretty quickly after attempting some corrective measures. Um, but the real metric is that you're getting functional products and the real driver of continuously getting functional products over the course of a program is that the vendor is always striving to get that next period of performance to keep developing. Uh, and, and again, then just to tie it back to the actual metrics used, you can see that visually in the sprint retrospectives and, and again, the burn down chart. So those, those collaborative tools that you're using are reflective of what was produced and, and where it is. Jonathan, I'm a big fan of, of, of modular contracts, short contracts, I've, I've, but I've still, still seen a lot of resistance to them, at least across some of the components and teams I've been supporting. CIS, 
I think is all on board with that. Other components at my agency less so, at least at this point in time. They're still looking for the big and, and um, we have a long way, I think, to go to kind of buy in that contracting can be quick enough to make that work. And, and also that um, their development environments are there and ready to support that type of, of um, in and outs of contractors, our EOD process rates. So lots of things to overcome, but I think that's the right direction. Um, you know, another tool is really to help at least try to build in incentives within a contract and, and be be willing to walk away if performance isn't the right fit. And, you know, at a minimum, that's what we've been trying to, you know, encourage is, listen, if a contract's not working and you're doing everything you can and it's just not, you, you've got to be willing to walk away. Um, but but as I as I said, I think what you're what you're talking about is right there. Um, I, I've just seen I see we have lots more work to do. And, and uh, Polly, I'll add to that a little bit. Having having seen both sides at multiple organizations, um, also be aware that that the contract are not performing may or may not be a reflective of the contractor and may occasionally be reflective of the federal willingness to engage and, and, and being honest about that, that, hey, we need to make sure that we're, doing, that we're doing our parts on both sides as both contractor and as, and as government. I have seen at certain organizations, I've seen the government say, yeah, we're going to do six week sprints and because that's what we can handle right now. And I, I see some people smiling, but like, okay, that's great. Don't hold me accountable to deliver, you know, don't try and hold me accountable to a purist agile when you're mandating six week sprints to start with. So, so making sure that, that you, that you're trying to encourage the right behaviors. And I think, I think part of it is the people on this panel and, and CIS and, and several other agencies are really getting it and are really pushing, but there are still enough agencies that are behind the curve that, that still need kind of that education on the Fed side as well in order to really understand where they're going and, and how to get there. So don't always assume, yeah, we need to change the contractor. Well, sometimes that's true and sometimes it's, it's are we changing the contractor because they won't just say yes are we changing them because they can't deliver? And we need to, to differentiate between those two instances. Yeah, and, I, I and generally we, assume the problem is on the government side and, and I'm on that side. So yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, really what we're doing here, what we've been doing here this whole time is, is not really about implementing Agile. Um, that is just a convenient name nomenclature to try to get the conversation on the same page. What we're trying to do is change culture and we're trying to change culture such that trust exists and that trust has to exist at every level. So, you know, what Polly is describing is a lack of trust, very appropriately placed lack of trust in the procurement uh, career field to be able to replace a dismissed contractor efficiently enough so as not to disrupt the program. Because even a program that's delivering poorly is delivering, whereas when you get rid of a poorly delivering program or, or contractor to that program. Now nothing's being delivered. And that looks much worse today. It, it might look better 20 years from now when we didn't spend a billion dollars on nothing, but today it looks really bad when we're not spending anything, not getting anything done because um, we have expenditures, but it's, it's, so it's trust in that we can do that. And, and that trust is built, you know, one at a time, one success at a time. And that's why, you know, the, the agile movement as it is today is so important because, you know, you could change the name a hundred times over. It doesn't matter. The, the point is we're trying to build small things quickly. And every time we do that, we, in, we endure a little more trust between those who, who are going to allow us to do this on bigger, more important things. And then Josh, to your point, the trust between the vendor and the government is that honest conversation. So w what we're getting in these iterations is, is functional or it's not. It's accepted by the users or it's not. It, it, it is defective or it's not, right? So, um, and there's gradients of that, of course, but being able to say in an honest conversation, these were the reasons we didn't get there and these were the reasons we did is, is all based on 
the contractor not feeling like they're being, you know, the sacrificial lamb there and the government having the ability to set their ego aside and figure out where they're at fault. And, and so these are only overcome by very small wins that are built upon. Right on. And I, I think that the engagement levels of government really have to um, account for, for this change over time, meaning that we don't just toss a contract to a contractor and have them come back in X months or years to deliver a system. We're working with them throughout the process. And, and so it shouldn't be that we're saying, we need to get rid of this contractor, they're not working, because we should have been having those conversations over time, been aware of them and, and hopefully partnered to adapt. I, I see a lot of the time, we, we're telling contractors that we're at, at, at this as is place when we're really not there. And so they come in with this set of this approach that they're bringing to the table and they can't execute it as efficiently as they thought they could because of our back end processes that weren't really as is we said. And so we have to account for that and grow in it together and, 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 you know, flex. And, you know, that, that collaboration is really important. And I see a lot of discussion on our chat board right now around kind of user satisfaction and, you know, one of the guiding principles of the FAR, right? Uh, 1102 really focuses on the acquisition system. Our customer is the user of these systems. And so if we're not working with the users as we develop um, test, you know, design, design, test and develop, deploy these, these applications, these, these systems, then we're not doing um, our basic essential duty from a procurement perspective. Um. Yeah, I, I would just add. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, sorry. Carl, you go ahead. Oh, I'll be brief than you. Um, I just want to say plus one, two to everything that um, was just said. One of the questions we, we urge our government customers to ask at the beginning of a project is throughout and at the end of this project, where do you want expertise in the product to be residing? Do you want it? Do you want it all in the hands of one vendor? Do you want it in the hands of several vendors? Do you want to have some of it in-house? Should, should a lot of it reside with the eventual users? Um, and when an agency doesn't have any in-house IT expertise or sort of technical staff able to be a repository of that expertise, we, we structure the project differently. And we also say, like, this is, it's going to be harder than you think then. This is not going to go as easily as you thought or as you wanted because the, we are going to have to serve as a repository of knowledge that will eventually be bundled and sent, you know, handed over to users or some other entity. And we don't have the same relationship with those people that you do. So there's going to be communications overhead. So just the general idea that there has to be some technical and, and IT project management expertise in the agency in order to have a successful outcome is not just about managing the contractor, it's about communicating the results to the eventual users who may be the agency themselves or maybe you know, other people that the agency interacts with. I may have tried to pack that too densely, but I, I hope it made sense. Why don't, why don't you go ahead, Paula? Oh, I was just gonna say that if you're not talking to um, contractors or other feds every day, then, then you're not doing something right. <laughs> I mean, agile development takes work and it takes communication. And so that's why tools like Slack, Jira, um, and you know, just WebEx and Adobe Connect or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you need constant communication. Yeah, and, um, I do wanna um, uh, kind of jump on a couple of things here and, and steer it slightly and come back to um, actually Paula and Carl again, but the, I think that the point I wanted to jump on was the word trust that I heard a lot or trust mm -hmm. and open communications, right? There's a lot of that. And then you contrast that with the, um, the federal contracting system has grown up with the concept of like the Beltway Bandits, right? Like that's the name, that's contractors, that's us. We're the Beltway Bandits. We're gonna milk the government to get whatever money we can out of it and like make profit, right? So, um, it, and, and then what's interesting is when we get to scale, so we had a couple of 
audience questions around doing agile at scale, a couple of varieties on that. Um, and there is a challenge. There's a legitimate concern out there that if you have many, many people, maybe many, many contracts, one of the questions talked about you know, how many contracts should you have going on at one time? They cited an example at a state project, a state I won't name, um, that had you know, 35 contracts um, out supporting one program. Um, and so how do you maintain a level of trust and accountability um, balanced with kind of this agile ethos of everybody's going to be open, we're all going to, you know, we're all going to get along and, well, not necessarily get along, but but we're going to be very open, transparent, have high communication and, and not beat each other over the head if, if we don't deliver um, and so on. So, um, so I did want to pivot the conversation to scale um, and I, and I want to get um, Paula's input, because I know you have a few programs that you're looking at um, from the program side, um, and kind of just, you know, any tips you have for folks trying to to wrangle that scale would be helpful. And then from Carl, I wanted to get your perspective on just the open source ecosystem as sort of an interesting case study, because there, there are many thousands of uh, uh, millions, probably, of projects and, and many, many contributors um, in a highly dispersed fashion that kind of end up coming together um, to create either substantial or lots of really small um, things that can work together. Um, so, so that was a bit of a long-winded steering, but um, but again, you know, back to this, this topic of scale, um, I'd love to start with Paula's uh, input from the, the delivery side of the world. Oh, sorry, figuring out the mute button there. Um, so I guess um, on our side, um, it is, it, it actually does dovetail into what Carl was talking about earlier is um, in, in order to scale, it's not just, um, you know, lifting and shifting to AWS or to a cloud, getting out of the data center. It's also about um, what Carl said with open source is not having that vendor lock-in so that, um, if you do want to pivot to some other technology, which changes all the time, um, that's what we're striving to do: is be more um, open, open source first, um, and then um, as far as scale, that's why we're trying to move into um, cloud options. And we actually just brought in an innovation lab. Um, that's helping us look at Google um, as another cloud option so that we're also not just locked into, you know, AWS or Azure, um, but spreading um, our applications across um, different um, infrastructures, essentially. I don't know if I answered Thanks. your question, Ben. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, honestly, the take was a little bit different because I, you know, you were talking about really like system scale and and so on, which which I think is is also a really interesting point. I, I was um, even interested in scale in terms of um, basically lots of people, um, lo lots of people, and or um, because of that, lots of contractors. So if you have um, what seems to be multiple hundreds of people worth of work to do, yeah. how do you get all those people? Um, especially if they're in, you know, coming from different contractor organizations, different contract vehicles, et cetera. Um, you know, what are some of the challenges or lessons learned and um, in, in, in just keeping the wheels rolling from a, a process and people perspective? Yeah, we, I guess in our, um, in the systems delivery division, we have probably over 500 contractors across all of our applications. Um, one thing we did learn, um, back a couple of years ago is that we do um, write into the contract that the vendor is to cooperate and collaborate with all the other vendors that are part of the organization because of the, um, the integration necessary to, especially for um, CIS, we're trying to, um, by 2020, um, be fully electronic processing. So um, that obviously means integration across every contractor. Um, so we're still trying to figure all that and how um, to best communicate. We still have some hitches um, because you know, there's different management, there's different contracts, um, but we're trying to um, have um, big kind of, um, we call them PI plannings, um, and it's product increment 
planning with all the um, stakeholders and all the contractors, um, or at least you know representatives from the contractor groups, um, and do demos on where everyone is. Um, we're starting out with um, a, the I-539, which is a, a form, one of the forms um, that uh, provides benefit, and um, showing incremental progress um, and across the different programs. So it's been interesting. We've had a lot of hiccups. Um, and so we got to figure out a better way moving forward, but um, we're trying. <laughs> Thank you. Ben, ben, did you want me to, to take the, try to yeah, take yeah. the second part of that? Yes, please. Um, all right, so I, I'm, I, I could speak for, you know, all day long about open source. I'm gonna be careful not to do that. Um, and I know that probably a lot of the people on the call are familiar to some degree with how open source projects work um, out in the sort of commercial tech ecosystem. Um, so I'll, I'll describe it briefly, but I won't go into too much detail. The, um, the thing that makes it interesting is that you, you see very large entities who are often uh, cutthroat competitors in the marketplace, you know, like Google versus Facebook, right? Apple versus, versus either of those two or, or a number of other companies. And yet their developers are cooperating very nicely for years at a time on shared infrastructure projects that everyone is, that are released under an open source license and that everyone's using. Um, there are, this doesn't happen by accident. There are a set of conventions that make it possible, and those conventions are ones that government agencies and their contractors can use as well. Um, it's a little bit culturally harder for government agencies to do this. And in particular, one of those conventions is there, there is a set of sort of standard collaboration tools. It could be Zulip, it could be IRC, it could be Slack, but there's some kind of real-time chatting forum. Um, there's a mailing list usually, there's a version control repository, a bug tracker, you know, a few things like that. And the convention is that everything that happens in the project that, that affects the project happens in those public places. It doesn't mean you can't have behind the scenes discussions and make a plan and then come forward and propose it in public. But a project, an official decision in the project only becomes official when it is discussed and agreed on in the public forum where everyone can see it and participate if they want to. Um, this is actually very hard for government agencies. I have so many instances I can think of where a discussion that um, the development community was trying to have on the open forum would end up being routed back to private email by someone on the government side and we'd have to say, no, really, it's okay, have it in public, it's fine. Government agencies are just risk averse. The other things that make this work um, is the idea that technical participation is from individuals. That is, you may be working for a company, you might work for Red Hat or Google or whoever, or for USDS, but your standing in the project is attached to you as an individual. And this extends down to, um, to recommendations we make to vendors that if you want to be participating in a, in a truly, you know, you know, sort of open source compatible commercial way, you need to make sure that your employee agreements do not have clauses that prohibit the employees from working on the project if they leave your employee. Um, and that's just as important, uh, even more important for, for government projects where it's quite likely that you might want to hire one of those people to come inside the government or they might go to another vendor. So there's, there's a whole set of cultural conventions. I can't go into all of them. Um, but the, the last principle that's also important here is that for every entity in the project, your influence in the project is proportional to investment. There's, there are many different ways to run an open source project. There's no obligation that it be easy for contributors to come on board. You don't have to answer every bug report. You might want to for practical reasons. Um, but in general, the more, uh, the more your institution or your group of people makes an effort in the project, the more influence they will have over decisions. Whatever the governance structure, there are many different ways of structuring governance, but they all sort of adhere to that principle. And government agencies can exercise that influence directly or through their vendors. And putting that into the contractual language is, is an art um, that agencies are still learning. Okay, I've, I've tried to summarize open source development in five minutes. I, I hope I've uh, done something useful, but I've, of course, left a lot on the table. And was I getting at what you wanted to, to be gotten at, Ben? 
Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, the, what are the what are some of the parallels? Even though um, government's not necessarily going to shift to 100% open source development, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but kind of what are those some of those mechanisms and things that might help yeah. um, encourage the, some of those things? Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Someone's. Oh, I was going to say, Ben, for for the scaling, how do you scale? Um, one of my favorite quotes um, actually is from a guy at Barclays. Um, which is also a rather large institution um, who said, don't scale the teams, descale the work. And I think that, that government needs to get much better at descaling work and scope and dealing with smaller pieces, microservices, small delivery, fast delivery, add some, add some things to hook it into. Um, I, I'll call myself out. Uh, so Mark and I, Mark Schwartz used to be the CIO at USCIS and Ellis is their large program that has 17 to 20 teams currently running on it, something like that. Um, Mark and I had regular discussions about, about descaling Ellis to two teams delivering on it because we'd probably be, be faster, but we couldn't figure out a way to politically sell that. And and so it's about that descaling of the work to actually be faster, slow down to speed up. I, I mean, these are all things that we know and that we've heard, but we need to actually have the oomph in some ways to say, yeah, this really is the way in which we should work and let's make that happen um, where we are. Thank you. But that's really, uh, th that's perfect. And, and I do, um, I wanna start to steer us towards the end. Um, and, uh, because uh, we're we're coming, getting closer to that top of the hour, so it's time to start kind of um, start changing the shape of this conversation towards the end. And so I do want to really make sure that uh, you know this is a really tactical kind of discussion, um, and there's there's a lot of good that can come out of this, and I think a lot of the good is related to a couple of questions we had, um, one from. Uh, Ken that says, what are good resources I can point non-tech savvy contract analysts to? And another was, you know, how do I write um, statements of objective for knowledge work that contracting officers can improve? You know, a lot of these, um, you know, really more specific kinds of questions. So I'd love, um, you know, starting with, um, with, with Jonathan and then letting others jump in, love to kind of pivot in that direction and kind of start talking about what are resources? You know, where can people go? We can we can even drop some you know URLs in the chat. I mean, there are some things shared on um, the the panel and other things, but but I'd love to start hearing about um, you know where can people go for more? Where can you find contract language, or where can you find other resources to to really get down to to writing contracts and, and managing them? Yeah, sure. Um, and I have some thoughts on scale, but in the interest of time, I will not say them now. Um, but one resource you can go to is I have a YouTube channel that I make videos every Friday called Agile Acquisitions and Alcohol. And the next video I make is gonna be on scaling because I've got all these words in my head now, I gotta get it out. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that, and honestly, I mean, I try to cover all the different topics that uh, come up in any discussion I have um, just to capture them more for myself than for anyone else. Uh, but the TechFAR Hub, uh, techfarhub.cio.gov, um, is the digital, U.S. Digital Service Procurement Team resource page where we um, have basically put all of the things we've created in our time there. So there's templates, there's um, tools, there are um, playbooks, the, the, the digital service playbooks linked there. The TechFAR handbook is linked there. Um, there are um, field guides where we, you can just kind of like get an overview of how to manage certain aspects of this. Uh, so, so there's a whole bunch of stuff there. Uh, MITRE's website has a, a lot of great stuff on it. I dropped a link earlier about metrics about that. Uh, AGL's website uh, does a good job of capturing resources out there as well. Um, so yeah, the, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff out there. Uh, and then, you know, just if, if you know people uh, who are doing it, that's a great place to go as well. Um, you know, just ask people for what they've done if they've already attempted to de deliver it and they'll probably give you some lessons learned along with it. Oh, also uh, myfar.io. Yeah, uh, and I, I also put a link, um, uh, Polly, uh, I, I dropped a link in check to the, 
Slack, uh, to the chat to the pill um, page, so procurement innovation lab. Um, there, I know there is one thing because I went to one of the boot camp sessions there. Um, th there's a link down there for that, which had a lot of really practical advice on different sorts of tools for different um, kinds of flexible contract evaluations and, and other things there. Yeah, um, and, and, and the pill publishes a ton of things about kind of what you learn and, and so on. Right on. Well, everything's not specific to agile contracting. All of those techniques are appropriate for agile contracting. And more importantly, there's a lot of um, IT modernization projects that have been um, awarded through the pill um, across DHS. You know, we treat our procurements as agile projects. And so bring a lot of the, you know, principles of Agile and rituals into the procurement process um, for teams that run their efforts through the pill. So include all the way and in including to after award, we interview both successful and unsuccessful offers and get their feedback about how that process worked and then share those lessons learned and those solicitations forward. And I think that's a key, you know, Jonathan hit the nail there. If others have done, done it and you can start from there and then iterate and improve, in, in your solicitations and in your, you know, statements of objectives, et cetera, you're starting from a ground that's not zero and you can continually improve and iterate. And that in and of, in and of itself speaks to the very principles we're trying to execute on the ground. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And I think others, uh, you know, we're probably doing a good job of leaving both the audience kind of wanting more and the, and the panelists kind of having more stuff, on, you know, ready to share, um, but, but since we're, you know, uh, you know, time boxing is, a, is an agile practice that, that is great for a, a session like this. So I think I'll, um, I'll hand it back over to Melinda to kind of to close it out. And thank you so much, everybody. I think this was, it was great for me and, and hopefully um, just as informative for everyone in the audience and on the panel.